Ladies and gentlemen, live from the Canadian Broadcasting Centre, this is CBC Connects. today because we're talking about award season. Tis the season. Tis My the season. favorite <laughs> time of year. The Globes, the CSAs, the Oscars. I haven't slept a lot, but I'm very happy. I'm happy <laughs> as well, and I'm ready to hear about what your take on everything is. We have an amazing show. Today we're talking about how to create hit TV. We have some of the stars of our biggest shows here today, David Sutcliffe, Alan Hockle, Ron James, and we have their creative teams as well and some cool CBC production execs, so uh, we're gonna get that going in just a sec. But first, Eli, tell me, Canadian Screen Awards nominations were this week. What is your take? This is our Golden Globes. This is a big deal for us. It, you know, it's a really interesting year because this year, like, two of the most nominated uh, shows in terms of TV and film were Enemy and Orphan Black. Those are two very kind of dark, kind of challenging, twisted... Enemy is by Denis Villeneuve starring Jake Gyllenhaal. Toronto, as you've never seen it, it is some strange, warped stuff. And so the fact that this year voters were really kind of grabbing and actually applauding some of the more challenging material in both TV and film was actually a fantastic, but some you of my faves... You know what I like about Enemy? Jake Gyllenhaal times two. He plays his, uh, he does. himself and his doppelganger. The power so of two Jakes. Give and, it the award. You know, I, I had a chance to talk to both of them, Denny and Jake, together, and you haven't seen a bromance like this. They are so in love with each other. That's what's so great. The movie might not be for everyone, but this is like an artistic partnership. We're going to see more from them. And a lot of other movies I love this year, like uh, The F Word with Daniel Radcliffe did well. Gabrielle, this enchanting film from Quebec. Rhymes for Young Ghouls didn't do as well as I expected, but it's squeezed in there. And so, you know, you look at who's going to show up for the big show hosted by Martin Short. The fact that they got Martin Short to come back, he did such a fantastic mm -hmm. job last time. So classy and hilarious. What about TV nominations? CBC itself had 95 nominations. Yeah. CBC did very well, and I like the fact that they, uh, you know, they kind of spread it around, which is good. So I think it was a great, great year for everybody, actually. And the, the screenies, as we're now calling it, are kind of, you know, growing. And this year, we're kind of getting used is to the fact... Is that what we landed on? That's what I landed on. Okay. That's what I'm, I'm calling it. I, I was I think feeling that the Martys worked. for Martin Short. Oh. <laughs> there was a campaign going. <laughs> a different going. kind of award, I think. Well, everyone, if you have an idea of what you think the Canadian Screen Awards should be nicknamed, you can always tweet us at CBC, hashtag CBC Connects, and you can do that to join in the conversation at any point in time during, during this discussion. All right, so Golden Globes happen, Oscars. You're excited. I am excited. So tomorrow morning at 8.30, if you tune into CBC News Network, you'll see me live tap dancing as fast as I can. <laughs> they make the big announcement from L.A., some very tired star. It's going to be Chris Hemsworth. Thor this year will announce it. And finally, after we've been talking about Oscars since TIFF, since even before TIFF. So tomorrow, finally, we know who's going to actually be in the running for the nominations. Now, I still and hopefully, uh, all these people here are going to be in the running for Canadian Screen Awards uh, sometime in the near future. So let's get that conversation started of how you can get yourself there. Let's bring out our first guests. You guys ready? The star of the Ron James Show, Ron James. Let's give him a big round of applause. The star of Republic of Doyle, Alan Hocko. And the star of Crack, Mr. David Sutcliffe. I certainly will celebrate, but I'm, I'm you very guys happy to be working, well, actually, which means well, that I great. left my office, I came over here, and uh, you know, I put on a nice jacket, and now I'll run back to the office. It's show business, and if you're working, that's a good thing. It's an honor just to be nominated, yes, but also I would like to win. Why not? <laughs> they've done a really good job, I and mean, even since last year, I noticed that they've just keep growing it and growing it, and they are giving it that Oscar feel for us. Well, today we had 50 TV and film stars in the room today, so just for the press announcement. So you can imagine that we expect to have people from all over the world who are Canadian, who are not Canadian, but are in Canadian movies. We're celebrating our 65th, and uh, imagine 65 years of dishing out 
awards to the best town in the country. It's a great job, I have to tell you. I feel really grateful to know so many talented and creative people who are making such amazing things. I really think that Canada is in its golden age as far as film and television. People think what we do is glamorous, but it really isn't. And uh, so it's nice to get some designer to dress you up and to step out and uh, feel really glamorous for an eye. We're hot. And so we're going to have a very hot night. All right, that was a peek at uh, this week's Canadian Screen Awards press conference. It was a bit meta, David, because you were there and now you're here, but that's because you hosted the press conference. I did. I hosted the press conference. I took my turn uh, trying to be a broadcaster. So I, I understand how difficult your job is. Congratulations. All your shows are nominated. What do you think of the nominations this year? Congratulations to the man here for nominated for uh, Best Actor in a Dramatic Role. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Very cool. So, guys, what do you think it takes to make hit television? Uh, do you want to feel this one first? Uh, uh, what does it take to make hit television? Uh, putting one foot in front of the other and getting into the trenches every day and doing the grunt work. Uh, there's no shortcut. Um, life's about the long haul. And uh, that's one thing, uh, that it doesn't happen overnight. The second thing is to be surrounded by an exemplary team. Uh, Lynn Harvey, uh, the executive producer uh, of the show, and Gary Campbell, who will be coming out in a few minutes, uh, have been taking uh, the ship in the same direction with an exemplary crew. And so if you have a strong creative foundation mm -hmm. and you have uh, folks who are um, uniformly focused uh, on the brand and what we're trying to say and the point of view of the show, uh, and we're all in agreement, then uh, it makes for a, a marvelous way to make a living. Because if you can cross the threshold making a comedy show with a spring in your step every Monday and know that um, you're delivering the funny for uh, the second largest national landmass on earth, then it, it feels like um, an honest day's work. Feels pretty good. Yes, it does. Alan, you created a show that now is into its fifth season, but what did it feel like to get the green light for your own national show that you were the star of and that was your own idea? Uh, the, that, uh, to have an opportunity to make, we were just kind of discussing that by having all of you guys here today uh, means a lot to us as artists and as creators and as, as actors and whatnot because you spend most of your life in this industry particularly in this country, trying to get anybody you can to pay attention to the work you're doing. So I spent a lot of my life convincing my family and my cousins and my aunts and uncles to come see my plays and to do this or to do that. And to know that you have an opportunity for a world stage to make a show that is going to be embraced or hopefully embraced by Canadians, it's a very special thing. And uh, all of us, I'm sure all of us here and all of us with Republic of Dole, we're very grateful for all of uh, people's support over that kind of thing. Can you, can you remember where you were when you actually got the green light? When it went from being, okay, I have a show Bible, I have some ideas, I have some, some people I want to gather, and they actually said, okay, this is real now, yes. Yes, I, I do. I'll never forget it because it was the single most defining moment in my life probably. Um, I remember when we got greenlit for our pilot, Sally Caddo called me, uh, who was then the head of drama, who's now, I can't remember what her title is, but in charge of everything, uh, or one of the people in charge of many things. And Sally called me and told me that the show was greenlit for a pilot, and I kind of, I guess I wasn't enthusiastic enough, so she yelled at me to be more <laughs> excited. But I was just trying to play it cool. I was like, well, that's good, but we should talk about uh, this. She was like, Alan! <laughs> Uh, be excited. And then the next time she called me, we were we had done a little retreat about how we'd like to plan uh, a new season or a new, uh, if we were going to build a season, we were in Florida and I was going through customs and I got the phone call going through customs and I told the security guy, which you should never do in customs, I have to take this phone call. <laughs> and uh, she told me that we were greenlit and we were all very stoked about that. It's a great story. David, uh, we were all very excited when David came to the CBC to star in Cracked uh, last season. We're now in our second season. Now, the, I don't know if there are any Gilmore Girl fans in the audience. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Evidently. There always are. Uh, what was it about that show that drew you to come do it and that's keeping you happy as a performer still? 
Uh, what was it about Gilmore Girls <laughs> or about Cracked? About Cracked. Yeah. Uh, well, Cracked was just a really interesting project and uh, a really interesting character for me to play. Um, you know, a character who's struggling, who has a uh, mental illness. I mean, those are the kind of characters actors are looking for. So um, it was it was exciting to come back to Canada and to work for the CBC. And I didn't know, uh, you know, you shoot pilots and you never know how they're going to go, what's going to happen with them. So I was excited that the that the show uh, uh, was picked up, and now we're in our second season, and I can I think we're starting to gain some momentum and figure out what it is. So it's uh, it's it's exciting. And we have your creative teams here today. You've been having fun reminiscing with everyone in the back. Do you get to do this often, to do a show like this together? Never. Yeah, Never? Yeah. Uh, 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 John Vatcher. John, right? John. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, one of the creative uh, uh, executive producers of his show, I realized that his family and my family are from the same little granite pimple uh, of an island uh, off the coast of Bergio really? in Newfoundland. It's unbelievable. So the, uh, that was usually good. And I think his great aunt owed my grandmother five <laughs> bucks, so I'm getting it from him today. Yeah. Collecting. That's some serious interest. Well, as you can yeah. see, yeah, yeah. Right, uh, Definitely we don't get to in do this tune. Office. We're playing on the same hockey yeah, team. Absolutely. We just don't have the logo yet. <laughs> All right. We, before we bring out their creative teams, let's take a look at some of the hit shows that they make. Cliff on the end, that handsome man is the co-creator and producer of Cracked, Callum DeHartog. <laughs> to the other side of David is Helen Azamakis. She's CBC's Senior Director of Drama, Commissioned and Scripted Programming. So you guys want to get in a room with her. Uh, Perry Chafe beside her is the co-creator and writer of Republic of Doyle. Beside him is the executive producer of Republic of Doyle, John Vatcher. I'll remind everyone that Alan Hocko is not only the star of Republic of Doyle, but he's also the co-creator, writer, and he's the executive producer. He's a busy guy. Michelle Daly, beside him, is CBC's Senior Director of Comedy, Commissioned, and Scripted Programming. <laughs> Gary Campbell is the co-executive producer of The Ron James Show. Ron James, of course, is the star, co-creator, and writer of The Ron James Show. You know us. Beside us is Heather Conkey, who's the head writer of the hit show Heartland. And last but not least, please welcome Peter Mitchell, the showrunner of the international sensation Murdoch Mysteries. Thank you all so much for being here. This all is right. a mighty array of Canadian talent in one place. I don't know if you folks realize how special this is. This is quite the happening. Yeah, so we're going to start with our questions and keep yours ready in mind. And then we're going to have a big Q&A period where you can give your questions to Leah. And you get prizes for doing so. So you can only win. All right. A lot of people who are here who are interested who've been tweeting us, we're not necessarily at the point where we're in the fifth, sixth season of our hit show, so we do want to know how to begin. So maybe you guys can share some of the stories about where the ideas, where the pitches came from. And Callum, you have a really cool story, so maybe you can remind people what you do, and still do, and then how you got into television. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, I guess uh, I've been working as a police officer here in Toronto for close to 15 years and always enjoyed storytelling and the premise and it was just a neat way to express some of the experiences I've been through. And uh, along my journey, I'd uh, come across what are known as crisis intervention teams, uh, the pairing of a police officer and a psychiatric uh, professional. And that relationship sort of evolved where it felt like a really neat partnership that I'd never seen before and it kind of lent itself to storytelling as far as 
relationships and the worlds that they could explore together as a team coming at it from uh, two different perspectives. And I partnered with, uh, I pitched it to a production company. They were incredibly positive about the idea and the concept. And then I met with uh, Tracy Forbes, who's a writer, and she helped sort of flesh out the idea. And that's kind of how we then pitched it to a, you know, CBC. And then they responded, and then it just developed from there, and you worked together collaboratively as far as sort of piecing out, you know, the broader landscape and the bigger picture. And it sort of evolved from there to pilot and actors and seasons and now are finishing our second season. So it's been that kind of journey. It's been great. Taking what you've experienced and then breaking it into like a 52 minute script, that's not natural, right? It's a very different kind of reality. What was the biggest part of the learning curve as you entered this world of television for you? I think, I, I remember the first time I walked into a story room and, and actually seeing how an episode was, was broken down. And, and for the, I guess it was the first time really sort of looking behind the curtain and I was like, I get it now. It kind of makes sense as to the arcs of characters, the arcs of stories, the development of where you see it. And that's sort of the vision of the showrunner who comes in and, and the team of writers that they bring in. It's, I guess it's the collaborative effort and the size of the uh, team that you really start to respect. Mm -hmm. And you realize that, you know, it takes all of these minds, all of these perspectives, all of these opinions, and how that crafts a bigger bigger um, arc, I guess. So that was really neat. And like I say, the fundamentals and the physicality of it, of seeing how you break down commercial breaks and stuff, I was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> well, interesting. Callum and Helen and Alan, maybe you can tell us, how prepared do you need to be or experience you need to be to get that big show? Because you seem to have learned a lot by virtue of being in it already. Uh, did you say my name too? Yes. <laughs> well, it's funny. Uh, in, for our, in our situation, for Republic of Doyle, the three of us, Perry comes from a very similar situation, although he's not a uh, trained professional private detective. Uh, I think you pretended to be one when, in, your, in your other day job. I come from the theater, and I started a theater company, and I started producing that way. And I think when you get a big, a major production in the theater off the ground and you actually get uh, it to be successful, you realize you can do anything because it's almost the most impossible thing that I've ever conquered. But I just, like Ron was saying in the early, in the earlier, you just have to attach yourself with the greatest people who are uh, sitting right next to me. And, uh, you know, luckily you'll get an executive like Helen who worked with us from the very beginning and we were able to sort of f form some kind of path into the impossible. I don't know if that makes any sense. Here. Like I was just checking potato. on it. Uh, yeah, it does. When we actually started ours, there's a funny little piece there. There's, it, it, as you try to get your really, really good idea, you, you, you can't do it by yourself. So you have, to be, you have to have a good idea. You've got to be open to a good idea. But really, best idea wins. And I remember when he was pitching this, we'd done a feature together. We brought Perry on. We said, we should do some stuff. Do you like stuff? Yeah, I like stuff. Do you like? Yeah, let's do stuff. So when we had these ideas, they had a couple really great ideas. We took them. We pitched them up. And when we did the first section, he goes, well, they want to meet now. Sally wants to meet. Yeah. So he went up with four pitches. And he had some really good ones, and they were great. But you've got to, you, there's, a, there's this thing when you're going for the big idea and have the big idea, you don't know if it's the idea until they go, that's the idea. So I was pacing around back in Newfoundland as he was here in Toronto pitching these four ideas we knew about. And he calls me back later. He said, well, I said, well, did they go with the, the grocery store one? They had, no. I said, well, how about the one with the, no. Well, how about the, <laughs> yeah, no. But they went. What did they go with? Well, with the father and son PI thing. I went, the what? Then with the father and son P.I. thing. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's a thing I thought about when I was 14. I thought it was a really good idea. <laughs> and when you're in that meeting and they're going, no, no, it's cool, but it's not for us. And then he goes, well, I got this other one. And he just kind of, and they went, yes. <laughs> and we had to, and then Perry went, I know that one. I go, you didn't even tell me about that one. <laughs> so you've got to be open to the, the good idea and be passionate about that good idea. And you got to sell it and then you got to live up to it. And that takes more than just yourself. It takes that team. But and how I, developed does that yeah, have to exactly. be, right? Because father and son PI, but then, you know, sometimes you get the question, okay, what happens in episode four? Yeah, what happens, what's, what's, do you have to worry about the arc of the season when you walk in with that elevator pitch? People definitely do have to worry about that. I don't. Perry does. Perry? <laughs> <laughs> this is I about do. division of labor. Yeah, that's why I became a PI for many years. No, I wasn't actually. Uh, no, it's a good question. The pitch is funny. The core of the pitch is the pitch. It's, it's your idea and so on, but... 
it'll go through so many stages by the time it actually hits air. It's incredible. So you have the world in mind. We had the world of a, of a father-son PI team, which we pitched. But the overall arc and so on of those characters, who are those characters that are come and play in that world, it takes time to develop, and it takes a team like these guys next to me and everybody up here, you know, it's because it's so tough. I mean, it's almost impossible to get a TV show made. So I have such respect for anybody, everybody up here, and everybody who's doing this. It's just crazy. But it's amazing when you look back on the original scripts we, uh, we, we first started writing with and we're, how far we've come. It's incredible, actually. I think our first one was about a Viking sword fight. <laughs> Was, uh, was the actual first episode. It was like, ah, let's have two Vikings, uh, reenactors, fighting. It'd be great. Jake solves a crime. I think they were melting down swords or something for their armor. So uh, we put that one on the back burner <laughs> after we spoke and pitched that one. It was like, I think, and you guys were so cool. It's like, you know what? Uh, why don't you put that one away for now? Like, almost like they put it on the fridge. It's like, oh, no, this is great. Let's put this one over here. You like, may make it one day, right? I oh, think. yeah. No, Helen, no, no. can you tell us no. a little bit, uh, Michelle, if someone could give Michelle a mic too, about... The process, the length of maybe getting from your idea to fruition and what people can realistically expect so that they don't lose hope. Okay, well first I just wanted to, to step back and the pitch, you said, you know, what's, how detailed is the pitch? Do you know what happens in episode four? We will ask that question, but um, oftentimes uh, the, the creators don't have that answer yet, but it just gets, if we're asking that question, I think it means this is kind of interesting, I want to know more. So it's the, it's really the question of I want to know more. So they've kind of hooked you in. You haven't worked all that out yet, but um, that's where if we're interested, we will go into development and we'll start talking about what happens in episode four together. Um, so, but the process is um, someone will come in They'll tell us what their idea is. We look for passion. You know, what's, the, what's, you, what's this story? Why you really want to tell this story? Does it fit for us? Um, and if those questions get answered, we will put something into early development, which means we'll maybe see a Bible or uh, a Bible and a script so we can flesh out the characters. And that's the other thing, character. Who are the, who, who are the characters? Uh, that we're following, that we're going to fall in love with week after week. Um, what's the tone of the, of the series? Uh, and, and what's the world? So what's the world? And, you know, in your case, it's a, it's a cop show. It's very rooted in Toronto. Uh, Doyle is a PI show, very rooted in St. John's, Heartland, very rooted in uh, the Alberta foothills. And Murdoch, very rooted in turn of the century. So... Um, those are kind of the three questions. The characters, the world, the tone. Those are kind of the three things that we really look for in the early stages of development. Michelle, I don't know. Thank you, Helen. Did I cover that? <laughs> yeah, and it's pretty much the same for comedy if we're doing a scripted comedy, but comedy, as you know, comes in many forms, and um, on CBC as well, we have uh, the Rick Mercer Report, 22, the Ron James Show, which aren't um, scripted half hours. There's um, shorter elements to them, and they're sketch and stand-up in the case of Ron's show. And so in those instances, we may want to not develop scripts so much as maybe um, like a proof of concept, which is just to kind of show that the, the creative kind of background of, of what it is will work. Because you can, you can talk about it, but until you see it kind of play out in a, in a real visual manner, you you don't know that it's going to work for television. I so. imagine with comedy and the rise of the internet, it, you're, you must be seeing a lot of different material now where everyone has their own YouTube channel and you know, we don't need to come in and send you a pitch anymore. I'll just email you my links or my best Is of. That or, it's, it's a start. It's, a, it's more than, uh, you know, if it's somebody, I'm trying to think of, um, I can, no, of course I can't think of anything off the top of my head, so that's awesome and it makes me feel very credible. Um, <laughs> It's good. I'm in the shop. It's, don't worry about it. You're in good hands. Um, but it does, it, it kind of, it, it gives you, it's all marketing, right? So before, a lot of comics would do commercials. So then they were building their profile right. and building their brand. And, and now your internet um, notoriety and, and that also helps. And just, right. it just leads to, um, you, you, it just makes it a fuller package when it comes time to make decisions. For people who are more focused on performing than producing and writing a scripted concept, uh, will you take a chance in development on people? Like, 
Yeah, I mean, I think for comedy, it's, you know, you're never really sure where the, the hit is going to come from because it's so subjective and it's, it's um, you know, there's the saying, it's easy to make people cry, but it's hard to make people laugh. So you have to really take a lot of chances in comedy to find out what um, really sticks and what resonates. Because what, you know, comedy, there's ebbs and flows of comedy and what is popular and um, kind of on the nose right now might not be um, you know, what the appetite for the audience is in the year or year and a half that it takes for it to get from the pitch to um, being on homes and computers at home and on, you know, worldwide. On that note, development, you explained what happens, but what does it really mean to the person who has a show in development in terms of how far it is from potentially or close to being on the network? Well, I mean, we don't, we don't develop, um, you know, we don't have tons of money. We're not like the Americans, right? They just throw money at everything, which is, I'd love to get to that stage, but that, you know, I'm realistic. Um, <laughs> so we have to be very, very, um, targeted in who we um, choose to develop with. And, and when we choose to develop, you're, you're, you're miles ahead of um, so many other ideas. And um, you know, you're exponentially closer to getting your, your show. At least, if we're going into development, then we believe it could be on TV. So then right there, you have a, a much greater chance of it happening. This isn't like the States where you might get 60 pilots, and then of those, one or two or three gets picked, picked up. You don't have the luxury of experimenting like that. Exactly. Because, you know, it's, we have finite um, money, so we have to be very careful. Callum, you mentioned uh, the role of the showrunner in the process for you. I'm curious to know, guys, can you explain to our audience exactly what a showrunner does? Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the best way to describe it is you're kind of the first one in and the last one out. Um, Right now with Heartland, we've, we've stopped shooting uh, mid-December, but it doesn't stop. Luckily, we, I can't say, can I? Anyway, we're, we're in development uh, for another season, Ooh. our eighth season. And it's, it's thrilling, but it's also, that's kind of the hard part, coming up with ideas for new shows that are still fresh because this is our eighth season. So keeping it fresh is a huge part of the showrunner's job constantly keeping the vision, but also creating new, believable storylines that don't take you out of the box. Because Heartland is definitely rooted in a, in a family saga. And we have hopefully made all those characters really believable. And the minute our audience knows them, and the minute we go out of that box, they know it. So part of the challenge of the showrunner is to keep that vision, keep the characters real. Um, make sure it looks beautiful. Um, I, I, part of the edit, I'm part of the mix. Right now we're mixing shows, so it's all the music, it's picking the songs with the help of our music supervisors. And again, it, it's also just keeping a team with the same kind of vision. The vision is the hardest thing to keep, I think. I don't know, uh, on, the on our of, show. On the note of vision, Peter, uh, well, Murdoch Mysteries and also Heartland, they're based on popular book series. How is the development and pitching process different when you're taking something from a book into, uh, into a network to pitch? Well, I wasn't around for the original conception of Murdoch, but obviously it was based on Maureen Jennings' novels. Um, the core of that is, is, is the core of the characters. I think as the show evolved, those characters uh, d deviated from, 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 from Maureen's, you know, uh, Crabtree is married and a big hulking man in, his, in, in, in the books. On the TV show, he's Johnny Harris. Uh, uh, so the, <clears throat> the core concept of a, a Victorian era detective using his brains to, to solve crimes is, is is the touchstone of the show uh, as the show's developed. Uh, those characters grow. Uh, the tone of the show is different than the books and that the books are uh, presented darker, uh, sootier, uh, unemployment to Toronto, whereas the, 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 the tone of, of, of our show, uh, it, it varies from episode to episode, but it is a, a, a brighter, sunnier Toronto with a greater emphasis on Murdoch's genius as opposed to his police work. So uh, uh, the show to, to work for a television audience, at least the, the choice they made was to stay with the core concept of the book, but, but to, to lighten it. Uh, 
So, I'm not sure 10 years ago the word showrunner was even in the lexicon, and I think it's the rise of shows like Breaking Bad and Mad Men and this explosion of kind of specialty provocative dramas have kind of changed the way the industry looks and respects producers and writers. Is that making your job any easier? Do you find you get a little more leeway or respect these days? Uh, I don't think by them throwing that name at me does that. I, I hope my experience gets that. Uh, certainly uh, an acknowledgement that a, a, a head writer is more than a head writer now on a television show. They're the head casting director. They're the head uh, uh, picker of, of talent. They're the cheerleader. Uh, it, 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 it certainly makes my job easier in that we acknowledge a need for that person. Mm -hmm. How does that compare to the Ron James show, which is a different format? What? <laughs> Sorry. How does what compare to the Ron James show? Sorry. I, I, I just love listening to Peter's voice. Format it, just, it, just, it takes me to a better place. Um, Sorry, what was the question again, though? Format of development. Format of development. Well, it, it is very different with sketch, obviously, because you're not starting with a single, uh, as clear a concept. You're trying a whole bunch of different concepts. And then you have to figure out if all those concepts then work together. Um, and you're also, I mean, Ron and I have known each other for a few years, but there's, a, there's an element of getting to know each other, too, particularly with comedy that's very important. You know, many people here have mentioned trust. Huge. And... And also, beyond trust, and, uh, and again, I'm completely going off topic here, but people have mentioned passion and heart. Caring about what you do is so important, uh, particularly in the development process, finding those things. And we were fortunate in that we care about the same things. And you might not think that's important in comedy. You think comedy is glib and, and blah, 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 but it's, it, it's so much about what you care about. If you don't write what you care about, and I think that applies to everything we do, uh, you're in trouble. You, you know, it, we don't. Uh, sorry, I was about to speak for everybody. I don't. I don't make. I don't make TV shows. I, I do. Uh, sorry, you know, now I was about to lie to you. I do. I do make it to support my family, and I and I do like uh, having my work appreciated. But at the end of the day, you, you do it because uh, you're excited about it, because you care about it, and you want to surround yourself with people that care about it equally. I mean, I'm amazed how many TV shows you end up on where you, you look at a room and you go, every single person in this room cares as much about this scene as I do, which is amazing. You know, you, we, there's, we tend to think of TV as a heartless, cold place sometimes um, because it's portrayed that way in the media and on, and on television. But really, uh, I've met some of the most passionate people in writers' rooms. Um, and, and with comedy, comedians are um, trying to find a room-friendly word. Um, <laughs> jerks. Um, <laughs> quite often, and but if you're lucky, and, I, and I've been and I've been very lucky, they're jerks who care. Why is our producer laughing really loudly at that comment? <laughs> uh, we know we know we know we know we know many of the same jerks. That's why. Um, so I, I didn't even come anywhere near your question. Was I within no, 100 great. miles of what you asked? But we are curious about when you are at the outset picking the right people to work with, because it is more fun to partner up with someone and do this project together. But then if you do get ahead somewhere with a network, for example, you're into some pretty uh, big stuff. It's really important to everyone. Any advice from you guys or from the Republic of Doyle team about what works for you guys and how to find the right people to work with or avoid the, the wrong people to work with? You, you had run. I'll just finish. Uh, just as a, for a comedian, uh, uh, I don't know if there's any comedians out here, but um, uh, once again, to reiterate from the top, uh, what I said, you you have to have a team that's taking the ship in the same direction. The network needs faith, and you have to hone your craft on the lonesome corners of country. Uh, for 15 years. It doesn't happen overnight. You don't catch lightning in a bottle. You gotta wake up in a shitty hotel room in Fort McMurray and know that you're living the dream. <laughs> you know, you just do. And there is no shortcut. So when you finally get a room together, uh, it helps if the people in that comedy room, uh, in the writing room, also have the live ear. The ear for performing live. They have to know what silence is. They have to know what 
what gets a laugh, and they have to know what's going to work. And the only way to know what's going to work and to hone that intuition is to hone it in the um, arena uh, of the road. And the road, uh, uh, you know, I have a saying where um, the road takes no prisoners and comedy doesn't suffer fools. And it's true. And if there's anybody out there with aspirations to do the work, let the work be the aspiration and not the grail at the end of the trail. Because when you do get to the grail at the end of the trail, if you're as fortunate as we've all been to be surrounded by, as Gary said, caring people with an ear for uh, the funny, then uh, everything will work out. But you need a room for comedy with people who have an ear for the funny and who've honed it over time. It doesn't happen overnight. It's an interesting difference than what we're seeing now with the new generation of comedians where it's about links and has it gone viral and they're in a way making their comedy in isolation, right? I put together a funny video, it's a parody of a trailer. Look at how many YouTube comments I got and it could be legitimately funny, you know I'm not knocking it, but they don't have those kind of instincts that you're talking about, about rhythm and timing and that's all that. That's the bogus shortcut that's perpetuated by this ruse of celebrity culture, mm -hmm. that you can catch lightning in a bottle by one creative YouTube clip. You know, come on, man, there was 45,000 people who lined up for that grumpy cat. <laughs> you know, cats, cats, I don't want to be a cat. <laughs> I want to be a working comedian, and you now have- I have to rip up this pilot. <laughs> but you have to know what it's, you have to know and learn over time how a joke plays in Kelowna versus yeah. one in Thunder Bay, versus one in Corner Brook, versus one in Toronto. And so this instant gratification with fame from YouTube mm -hmm. and everything, it doesn't buy my muster. You know, it's, you know, everybody wants to be rich and famous. Well, guess what? You won't be if you suck. And the only way to get there is to do the work on the road. So that's my little rant. Well, anyway. Michelle, you can speak to that. Grumpy Cat has a calendar. Ron has a national television show in many seasons now. Will you, who, what does it take? What is the pedigree you want to see to get into the room with you? Well, I, I mean, first and foremost, the show has to be funny. It has to be naturally funny. And it has to be something that's going to resonate with the audience. And what will resonate with a CBC audience might not be the same thing that resonates with a much music audience, because much music is now the comedy network. Um, side note. Um, but, uh, but you know what I mean? So you're, you, you have to, it has to be funny for the CBC audience and who we um, feel the CBC audience is and who we want to be the CBC audience. You know, we want to, um, so I think, you know, with, Ron, with what's Ron saying with the YouTube clip, I mean, that might get you a, a first season, but doesn't give you five seasons, you know? So that's, that's the difference, you know? It might be a bit short-sighted, and um, there might be a lot of buzz about it, and then people, you know, there's people, a lot of people want to work with those people, but as a, as a network executive, you have to know what's going to work in the long haul. So um, it might not be the grumpy cat. I have cats. I wouldn't line up for them. Um, but you... Uh, Maybe I would. I'm not gonna. Uh, I might. Uh, he's kind of cute. Uh, but you, you want to, you want to know that um, all this work and effort that it takes on everybody's part, on our part as on the network, on the writing part, on the creators and the performer part, like we're we're in this for the long haul because it's so much work and you want to be able to continue doing it. And I think the difference between taking a, a YouTube sensation and throwing them up on on you know, on the conventional network, is, is really, you're just going to get a, a season, maybe two, if they stretch it, you know? Perry and John, I'm curious, and also Alan, because I think a lot of people here and watching online are at that stage where they're thinking of pitching. Do you rehearse? Do you actually perform your pitch when you know you're going into those big meanings, or are you just, you agree you've got something, and then you just kind of freestyle it? No, we wouldn't rehearse, I think, because then that would be, you'd be You'd be performing an untruth, I think. That, I think you'd get yourself in trouble. What we do, though, the three of us and one of our other partners, we always just ask each other tough questions, making sure that uh, we're all very clear about the creative, about what it is we want to do, what the story is we want to tell, make sure that uh, we can, you know, we've been working with Helen for a long time, that we can preempt any questions that may come to us, or we can try, <laughs> you know, to sort of avoid going down the wrong path or, or whatnot. So we practice and we talk, and, uh, but really, first and foremost, what we do above all else is focus on the story we want to tell, 
the characters we want to create and uh, situations we want to put them in. That's what you got to focus on first and foremost, I think. Helen, do you have pitching don'ts, like some kind of worst case scenarios you've seen? No names. <laughs> pitching don'ts. Um, yeah, um, I think when people come in, um, this is, I think I've seen this in younger and less experienced um, uh, writers or creatives. They come in and they, they ramble. Um, if you don't, you need to be clear. You need to be clear and concise because um, and I think the Banff, uh, when people go to the Banff Film Festival and we get a lot of pitches there, you might just get 15 minutes of an executive's time. And I think 15 minutes is a good thing to keep in mind that you could lose the executive if you just go on and if you're not focused but very clearly, what's your story? Why do you want to tell this story? Who are your characters? And, um, and, and keep it short because if the executive is interested, they'll draw you out to get the, the, the longer version. Um, and you gotta I, get the hook in first. Yeah, it, it, I guess it's the hook. It's, you know, why, and I guess you gotta answer the question, why is this the right story for this executive, this network? And, and the other piece of advice I would give is know the network you're pitching to. Um, what might work for CBC might not work for CTV or Global or, um, so just know a little bit of what's on the schedule of the network you're pitching to. Um, if they've got five cop shows, do they really need another cop show? You know, uh, or maybe that's all they're interested in. You know, just have, having done a little bit of research about where you're pitching, who you're pitching to, but, but in terms of the pitch, I would just, that would be my recommendation, is um, keep it concise and then let them, you know, ask questions. We're going to take some questions from social media in just a second, and if you want to ask some questions live, just start heading on over to Celia. But first, uh, it must be attractive to uh, find someone who's writing what they know uh, at the pitch phase. For you, David, as a performer working with Callum, you're also a producer and a director as well, but in this particular uh, case, uh, what was great about being able to work with Callum to play this role? Well, the best thing is, you know, we're on location shooting a scene and I'm trying to figure out would I pull my gun in this situation or not and I just text him you know what I mean <laughs> and I have an authentic answer and and often what's interesting is the answer is well it depends it depends on the situation I'm like you guys don't have rules specific rules um but no a big part of it is you know the nuance right like you you he Callum is very eloquent about uh about his experiences working as a police officer, and he's very sensitive to uh, to the people that he meets um, and that he has to deal with. So I think that that's been the most important thing for me, uh, because you know when you're we're doing a cop show that's trying to be authentic, uh, as authentic as it can be uh, for a television show. So having him there is a, is a huge plus for me. And Callum, you're still working as a police officer. Do you have any advice for people on how to balance a day job and then working on that pitch, working on that dream on the side? Uh, I think the best piece of advice you sort of mentioned in your question is the, the word balance, and that's something I've always tried to incorporate in my life across the board, emotionally, physically, and professionally. And I think when you kind of are doing what you love to do or you're chasing your passion or you're reaching for your dream, it doesn't really, it's not really that difficult to do, to balance. I mean, I, I would be doing this even if the show didn't work out. I'd still be writing, I'd still be running around asking my buddies at work to act in something funny and I'd still be getting the, what are you doing? And that's fine, and that's because I love it. And I think that there's something inherent to that. And, it's, and you know, I, I hope I answered your question, but yeah, it's like, definitely. it's not really a work thing, it's just something you have to do. There's stories you have to get out. And if you're going to do it, swing for the fences. And if you're going to miss, at least, you know, follow through and love it and keep on moving. All right, this is Leah Collins from CBC Connects. You want to start off with a question from social media? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, this question came in to at CBC from two people, actually, April Beatson and Ryan Nesbitt. I just want to know, how do you know you're ready to approach CBC with a show pitch? 
how do you know you're ready? So Callum, Alan, anyone actually, how do you know you're ready to approach the CBC or another network with a pitch? Oh, I thought you were ready, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's Heather. Good. I can answer that. I don't think you ever do know. I mean, you're passionate about your idea for sure, you go, or you wouldn't go in. Uh, you have to be full 100% behind what you want to do. Um, and you, you never know when you're absolutely ready, but you, you go in when you know your passion is at its peak. I think that's the way I work it anyway. <laughs> and Callum, for example, did you go in with multiple ideas? Like uh, Alan and Perry and... Uh, no, it, it was uh, one idea, and we had honed it, like I said, with a, 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 show, a writer partner and yeah. with the production company, and it was like, this is the one. This is, and I have to be honest, for this particular project, it just, there was definitely an aha moment for me that was like, ah, this works. This is just feels right. Let's do it. And Michelle, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, yeah, I, I just add to that as like, these execs are really good. Not just because they're up here, because then. Uh, but th they, they hear literally hundreds of pitches all the time. So they're very good. And you'll get a sense, as Helen said, if they're interested and they'll draw it out of you. But they're also going to ask questions about this thing. So you need to know it inside out. You need to know exactly what this world is about, even though you haven't created a, uh, necessarily a Bible for it yet. but. You've thought, you know, you've pretty much thought this through. You've talked it out. If you have a writing partner or a co-creator, uh, you know it, and it has to show in the pitch. They have to be like, oh, this, this makes total sense. This is, a, this is fantastic. And everything tracks. Everything makes sense. And just to clarify for everyone, because we've said the word a couple times, the Bible. Can someone quickly tell everyone what it is? Oh, Alan's got this one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so polite. Michelle. I was trying to get rid of all the mics, because uh, Gary and I have a pact that we didn't really want to talk that much. So we, I said, see, I got rid of all the mics. And thank you, Alan. That's so kind. What a gentleman. Um, a Bible is a, uh, it could be any number of pages, but about five to 10, writer, sir. Oh, I mean, we're in this together now. Uh, it depends, it depends on the show and, and what, how complicated the show is. But uh, you know, it's ideally like five to 10 pages. And it kind of creates on the page, it shows us, um, as network people, and you, how you know how well you write, um, how well you know the world that you're in, and then it's you break down some characters, the, the significant characters, and so that we all understand their motivations. And then the next part of it, I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of steps, um, are some episodics, so episode ideas for you know the first six episodes, and um, and then you see how they all kind of. You know, so you know the world you're in, you know the people that are inhabiting this world, and then you know the situations that you're creating for these people in this world. Great. And did you guys go in with that for every single one of those ideas that you pitched? No. A, a big part of this, too, you know, is you got, what Perry just said was right on. You got to know everything well enough. You at least have to know what your trajectory is going to be with the characters, with the story. So truthfully, when you get asked difficult questions in the pitch, you can make up answers. You know, yep. you, that's, that's our job as writers. <laughs> uh, you need to know it as well as anybody to say, and because those meetings and those questions may, be not, may not be questions that you were thinking of or were working on, so they should send you in a direction that you can have a cool answer. It doesn't need to be the right answer, but you should have fun in those pitches too. You're, so You're demonstrating your passion and that you're this, the voice and you know this world that you've created and you have an idea of where it's going to go. Yeah, and being from Newfoundland, we have the gift of, you know, being able to make stuff up all the time. <laughs> all right, we've got a question from the audience. Hi. Hi. Um, Callum, as someone who's not from this world and developing your own show, you said you took it to a production company first, but how did you get in that meeting with the production company? And Helen, would you recommend that someone as a first-timer would go that route first and then come to CBC, or...? Uh, I guess in, in my experience was uh, knocking on a lot of doors and, and getting out there just by meeting people and talking to people. And I think it became obvious that you want people with experience that can guide you, that can sort of help prepare you, can help a network feel more comfortable, and, you know, basically taking risks. I mean, it is also a business of risks, creative, emotional, financial. So it's about creating that comfort level. And so, yeah, I, I mean, there's many different ways that you can go, whether it's partnering with a more senior writer or producer, 
production company, and it also depends on the relationship that you develop with those people, or if you already have relationships at networks, and then perhaps they can give you, a, you, you know what I mean? I think it's another a piece of advice that I've taken both on my other job is to stay, stay fluid, you know, stay fluid with the situation, and stay fluid with the world you want to go, and, you know, rigid perspectives usually break, or they crack, but... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's, there's a lot of maybes, there's a lot of potentials, but stay fluid and open to it. Great. Next question. Oh. Hi. Uh, my question's for Heather. I know that you worked on Dark Oracle, which sadly got canceled prematurely. So when you got uh, started working on Heartland, did you approach working on this show differently so that it would get the success that it deserves and that it has gotten? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> there's such different shows. Um, yeah, I agree, it was premature. <laughs> Dark Oracle was really fun, but it's a totally, totally different kind of show. So I really couldn't apply anything to Heartland in a, in a way. The only thing I try to do with every show and, and with the writers as well is, is to create characters that you absolutely believe are real. And, and with Heartland especially, because it's such a multi-generational show, um, it, it's, you're dealing with every age group and making every age group believable. And I learned, a, 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 I'm not saying I didn't learn anything from Dark Oracle, I, I learned a lot, I mean, I, I, a ton. And you apply what you learn to every situation, but every show is so, so different. And uh, Heartland's just been an absolute joy to work on completely, right from the get-go, and I think the team that I work with, uh, it was, is just the, the right, group of people and the crew and the cast and it's just come together so beautifully like unlike any other show that I've worked on. Thank you. Hey Peter, how is it different to write for a period and get it right? <laughs> uh, I mean the thing about writing for a period at a certain point is you have to have the uh, you end up adapting kind of a faux period dialogue you know like every you know, new writer who comes into Murdoch, their first script is, is dialogue-wise just a disaster. Like bad you know, old English, yeah. I mean, slang. you could have a forced sooth in there. You know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and, and so it's 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 finding something that smells like it's real and, and 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 feels like it's real, but it's not necessarily real, and and so it's it's tricky uh, because we really don't know what these people sounded like. You know, most of the stuff that we would see would be written, you know? Uh, there's, there's very little audio of what people sounded like. And so our idea of what period dialogue is already in an interpretation in some ways. So you want it to sound kind of old timey. Uh, sort of like, <laughs> let's make it sound old timey, but not so weirdly old timey that it seems yeah. like bogus. So it's just, and what are the actors comfortable with, you know? So, so um, I mean, the thing about writing is, is that in some ways, is that in a lot of ways, the dialogue's the least important part of it, right? It's something like a Murdoch. It's, it's coming up with the engaging plot twists and stuff like that. So we sort of find the level that feels like it smells like period to me. Like people in the Old West, they sound like people in the Old West which is largely just our interpretations of, of movies. Did you all have fun working on the crossover episodes of Republic of Doyle and Murdoch Mysteries? I had a blast, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a good time. Uh, Newfoundland hosts very well. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> What's the best thing Alan took you to? Oh, it was, well, it was, you know, that we, you were, we were pretty much working the whole time, so, you know. I'm no, sure. but we were there for probably the most beautiful week of the summer, and the George, is George Street Music Festival was on. Uh, Kiss was staying in our hotel. You know, it was, it was magic. Everyone's, everyone's going to start Thanks hitting you up to do crossovers, Alan. You got to watch out. Uh, it was all Pete's idea, and uh, Perry did a great job, sort of spearheading it. Because I, you know, when I'm Perry and I show, we're on the show together now, and uh, which is a great relief to me for sure, uh, because of the acting part of it. So I couldn't really get back to Pete with the idea. I couldn't even imagine it because it felt like with all the things that were on my plate, it just felt like the most impossible thing in the world. And Perry was like, no, I'll just, I'll take care of it. And uh, the greatest weather we had when we shot the Murdoch episode in Newfoundland translated that when, <laughs> when we did the crossover for Murdoch, it was literally the worst weather we've ever had. 
to the same locations. Yannick was freezing his ass up. We're going to take another audience question in just a second, but first I want to ask, you mentioned uh, when a new writer joins the writing team of Murdoch. So, of course, you know, we all romanticize comedy writing rooms. Uh, what is the learning curve for new writers in your room? Or hazing. <laughs> you know what? Uh, sadly and boringly, we're a pretty kind room. Uh, I've been in rooms where it was brutal, uh, where there's... Uh, I worked on Mad TV many years ago, and that was a brutal room. There was like 15 people in there, so it's a huge room, first of all. Can I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a very different town in the United States of America. Um, How but, many are in yours? Four I would say half. four, five at the most, yeah. generally. I mean, and that's pretty typical for Canadian rooms. They're not, they're not very large. They're much larger down there. So, and so my TV was brutal because? Um, there were some jerks <laughs> in the room. Um, there were some, just, there's just, uh, there was a guy that, that, when I was, I was head writer on the show for a few years, and there was a guy that, Everyone said we got to hire this guy. He was working on SNL. He's a great sketch writer. But I talked to a few friends that I had down there who were, was, had worked with him before in the Groundlings and were sort of in that community. And they all said, he's an asshole. Uh, don't, he's, yeah, he's very talented, but he's impossible to, to, uh, to work with. And, and, and for, that's really important to me. It's, uh, you know, when you're spending so many hours in, a, in what can be a stressful environment, you want generally decent people around you. Uh, that really is everything for me. Um, and I was overruled by the production company, um, who shall remain nameless. Some nice people in that production company, but they, they just, all they were looking at was his resume. And they would not listen to me that everybody told me he was a jerk. And then, of course, he gets there and he was actually worse than uh, we heard. So it was awful. So you, you want to find nice people. Uh, and it, it's uh, it's important for the room to be compatible, like Gary said, you know. And uh, like we're laughers, you know. I don't come from the school where you nod uh, if it's funny. Uh, I like I like the laugh if it's funny. Yeah. That's usually the human response. And uh, I find that if uh, that being said, uh, uh, writing it is a serious business. Uh, but Gary. Uh, you know, we'll also, um, you know, confirm this, that, you know, it's got to be on the page. And as much as somebody is compatible, he's also, you know, he's also got to, he or she also has to deliver the goods. And um, I think that rule generally applies right across the board. But, uh, you know, having a compatible and talented room is, uh, is everything. And having somebody who gets it and gets the show they're working on is, is uh, equally important. Great. Another question from the audience. First of all, thank you. This is another endless reason why public broadcasting is so awesome in this country. Uh, thanks. Um, we've spoke about a, a number of formats. Uh, my question is, in pitching uh, a new issue to an existing, existing current affairs or perhaps even comedy show, uh, both TV online and, and radio, interjecting into an existing team based upon its necessity to have more content. Okay, are you curious as a writer, as a producer, to get on one of these shows? Well, it's not so much getting on the shows, it's assisting. Let's take, for instance, Fifth Estate or Marketplace, yes. and kudos to Marketplace for their awards, uh, their, their award that they should get. Um, shows like that, where I, as a social justice activist, uh, go out and, and find a lot of issues and linking up to those folks, whether it be a social justice comedy or whether it be current affairs related issues, how do I get hold of those executive producers and say to them, you know, I'm not part of your team, but I've got a doozy here that you guys should be totally all over. I'll let Ron answer comedy, but I will tell you that cbc.ca is, you know, your entryway to the CBC. All of the websites have ways to contact people, and there are people looking at those emails every single day. Like, they do not go unseen. And then, of course, social media is a great way to connect. Um, Leah Collins right there is always manning at CBC, and that's always a way that you can be connected to the right person. So you see something that you want to reach out to someone about, that is the way. Go to at CBC, go to their website, Eli Kanad, he's works and, in the news. And a lot of, you know, from, from the newsroom up there on the fourth floor, I mean, a lot of the program actually have tip lines or submission forms where you can start. The other way, honestly, I mean, it can be tough to get enough attention just from an email, especially if it's a complex issue. You want to try and get in there. You want to try and get in there um, on an intern program or something like that. We can actually get in the room 
on the newsroom and actually build some relationships which might help you get a little more attention than just an email saying, here's a great story. And Ron, if someone wants to pitch you jokes. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, well, um, I think he was talking about the overall pitch uh, of the show, so perhaps Michelle should feel this one. Because uh, I write my own material. Smooth, smooth. Um, well, I, I think you're talking about like a specific um, kind of topic or kind of point of view. In, so do you want to kind of see that represented on a certain show? Is that did I did I have that right? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm trying. I want to make sure that I answer your question. At a given point, so for instance, when Rick Mercer does his timely skits. Uh, 22 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. They're always looking for up-to-date content mm -hmm. and feeding that mechanism. I find I go up on Facebook and CBC 22 minutes or, or the debaters or whatever and feed it that way, but simply to kind of give some content to it because you folks are on a two-minute cycle on most of this stuff, and, and, and I don't say that the drama shows, please excuse me, but more so when it comes down to current affairs, and it's a fast-moving world, but at this point, there's a huge amount of complex issues that we need to get dealt with, if you were. Right, and I, I think um, in terms of uh, into an existing show that's maybe not a um, more informational show, there, we can run into some kind of legal issues because it's ideas and writing and all that kind of thing. So I think the, the, what Jamie said about um, cbc.ca and, and through um, social media would be maybe the best way to do it. Um, but I mean, like if you're talking about 22 or Rick Mercer, those are such tight turnarounds that, you know, we write the show on a Wednesday and we shoot it on a Monday and it airs on a Tuesday. So um, they're, they're covering things that are topical as, um, it also has to fit in with the tone of the show too. Yeah. And every producer of every show is really paying attention to the voice of social media, so that really is a great way. We have two more questions we're going to take. Great. Thanks very much. Um, Callum, I have a question for you. Um, my husband was with, was with the Toronto Police Service for over 30 years, and we watch a lot of the shows, we watch all your shows, and authenticity is really important to him. You know, you talk about drawing the gun, and he was, he's, was with the college many years. Do you find that more challenging now, all of you, when you're writing your scripts, the authenticity, the, um, uh, the dedication to the material? Because now we're in an internet world. You know, everybody can get that research. They can find out that fact, that figure. How, how does that figure into creating the show, pitching it, and then actually executing it? Because how much, how much can you clarify with Murdoch Mysteries as far as, you know, uh, the reality of it? Um, I would say, for me, it's, it's a bit more of a balancing act. It's, you find that sweet spot, because you're still storytelling really at the heart of it all, so it's a, you know, if it was too real, we're not making documentaries, you know, so we're just trying to find that uh, narrative dramatic engine to make something exciting, and that's kind of where we work together, like David and I was like, where do we find something that, you know, can uh, sort of meet a bunch of goals, the story goals, you know, the character goals, where they want to go, so it's a, it's a constant balancing act of trying to make it feel real, make it sound real, but at the same time, marrying it together with something authentic. I think if you just start with an authentic base, then you can then you kind of have to sprinkle some pixie dust all over the place. Okay. You know, it's it's the balance. I definitely make it watchable. I mean, you don't want to take yeah. it right out of the files of somebody's notebook or something because that's right. very boring. But do you, do you look? Of course, you look to current events. You look to news stories that are out there. Like what's? I mean, Toronto alone is enough of a resource for you for story ideas. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's personal experiences, and also remember, there's a lot of. Uh, people involved in the production, whether it's actors, the writers, the producers, and a lot of times they have their own personal experiences that can weave into a storyline sometimes. So there's a lot of bits and pieces that sort of create the overall fabric, tapestry of a story of your 45 minute or 50 minute episode. Last question, really quickly. Yes, yeah, so well, I'd like to uh, uh, commend everybody for do, telling our stories, Canadian stories, which uh, of course the CBC uh, is uh, a different kind of animal in the broadcasting world about that. I wondered just generally how important it is to uh, each and all of you uh, to tell Canadian stories and how we can do more to get those stories out there. I think, uh, I think that uh, for me it's, it's just telling the stories I know with the people that live it and I think hopefully that that comes across. I've lived in, you know, I'm from Canada, I've been in Toronto for almost 20 years, and that's where it comes from, my experiences. So hopefully that feeds its way in and people can relate to some of it. That's how I work. 
You know, when I started in stand-up, um, uh, I got back from Los Angeles. Uh, I was there for three years from 90 to 93 in the days uh, I was an actor. And I got back here, and I wanted to make it work here in Canada because I felt that there was um, uh, a mystery and uh, an iconography and a mythology that I could hang my hat on, that I could embrace, that there was something just as valid besides that uh, tarnished Vegas grail that somewhere, uh, you know, around the tip of Superior, there was validity. That somewhere on the road uh, and the embrace of people in place and the heartline hum of country, uh, that these stories were as valid. And I had an epiphany one night. I was playing Manitowage and the same night as the Super Bowl and uh, a tough mining town uh, around the tip of Superior. And I think I had about 250 people in the audience. And uh, it suddenly hit me that... Uh, you know, uh, 250 or 2,000 people now laughing in a snowstorm in Edmonton sounds exactly the same as 2,000 people laughing in Los Angeles when it's warm. And it's, it's, it's feeling the soul of country f from your feet up. It's, it's fundamental, it's elemental. And just like Callum said, it's where he lives, so it's his story. It's our stories. And, um, uh, I, I see no reason why they should be any less valid than something that comes uh, from the belly of the Hollywood machine. It's us. It's who we are. Simple. When you're telling those stories, we had a recent time we were trying to pitch a story, we had a piece, we were going through that, and we were just wondering, when you think about it, well, what format is this? Or is it like that? Or is it, is it just take all that away? Why is it the most compelling thing to you right now? Why is it the best story you want to tell? If you figure that out, and you can distill that to why I care, and then when you pitch it, why would you care? Uh, when you grind that all down, I bet you it's a good Canadian story. Because if you're a storyteller, it comes from where you are. You're a product of it. Don't try to make it anything. Will it play in the States or not? The first essence is, why do you want to tell somebody about it? And why would they care? If you do that, I bet you it's a good Canadian story. I'd just like to say something too the, about that because CBC is the one place that brings you Newfoundland and all its glory and Calgary and the foothills and the Rockies and all its glory and Arctic air and all its glory and I would just like to hear you give them a huge round of applause for doing that. In a way, we have now almost the best of both worlds. We have all these regionally specific stories and shows set where they live, and yet internationally, these shows are also very successful. So you don't worry about telling a global story. You tell the story you live, and then the world finds you, right? There you go. Absolutely. All right, so if you have more questions, you can see everyone over there on that step and repeat, or you can just have fun and take a gorgeous photo with them. Next week, we're gonna be talking to the people behind Best Laid Plans about how to take a book to a series, but today, I really wanna thank all of you for being here. This was really great and informative. You can always reach us at CBC, hashtag CBC Connects. Thank you, Eli, for joining me, and we'll see you next week.